thanks for the opportunity to interview you. Um, one of the interesting things that um, we've been following your story on, on our podcast, and uh, we wanted to kind of know who has been the, been the biggest influence in shaping your opinions on liberty. So my theoretical interests right now are something called like imminent reversal. That's what I call it, and it's presented in the metaphysics of John Baudrillard, among other post-Marxist thinkers. And one of his suggestions is that uh, technology, hyperculture, as we have it now, um, they contain within them at, at the present seeds for reversing entire orders, um, political orders, social orders, cultural orders. And my my intuition has been to use what were otherwise technologies that have been kind of innocuously branded uh, to fuss out, or to suss out uh, some of their, their liberative potential. Um, but that could be, it's like an ad reactive potential too. So I don't, when I, when I go market like a ghost gunner or the liberator pistol, I don't go, oh, hey, look, this is the greatest thing for liberty ever. Look how awesome it is. In fact, I almost, I almost completely just market it as the nightmare scenario um, for the referenced, you know, contextual dominative power. I, uh, I almost message it completely to them. And then I let our audience, who I believe to be, uh, you know, just right thinking, you know, constitutionally minded Americans rejoice in it. But I'm not actually speaking to the, the freedom minded. I'm trying to, at least in, in the media, right, uh, fight that kind of supposed power. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Now, um, like Wired Magazine named you one of the most dangerous people in the world. I mean, along with like dictators, terrorists, um, just a whole bunch of bad people. In your opinion, who is one of the most dangerous people in the world today? <laughs> cool, yeah. Uh, let me think about it. Um, you know, what's so great about political agency these days is that it's, it's dissipating. And so I don't, I don't actually see any traditional, especially like, uh, 20th century style tyrants as being that dangerous. Someone might say, like, oh, Kim Jong-un is a dangerous man. Yeah, okay, fine. In a material sense, maybe. Not really. Uh, in terms of human suffering, like, I, that's not how I do the calculation. I think one of the most dangerous people in the world is, let's say, Eric Schmidt, at least former, uh, formerly. Uh, maybe now Larry Page. Uh, people who have at their disposal the engines, at least by proxy, of the, of the fulfillment of U.S. foreign policy or domestic policy, the people who are uh, what the, the professed non-ideological heads of large sectors of technology, Elon Musk seems kind of dangerous to me, even Peter Thiel seems dangerous to me, uh, that's how I'd answer the question. People who have at their at their disposal um, real cultural power uh, through technology firms. and I mean, like Thiel, for example, controls Palantir and all these other technologies, even though he's a professed libertarian, the guy scares the hell out of me. Well, is well. I guess that's that's my that's my next question. Like, are are you interested in promoting like libertarian type of ideas? Like, what I guess what is the what is the impetus behind you marketing yourself toward um, like the powers that be, you know, and just kind of explaining to them you know where the dangers are in their in their power. So honestly, man, this bubbled up, but it's like any anything else that's organic. So I I didn't have the words for it when we were doing WikiWeapon a couple of years ago, but. Now, I, the best way I could put it is uh, I think of things in terms of the spectacle, the spectacle in the old situationist sense, and that was supposed uh, to be uh, an analysis that, that, that supposed unilateral communication. Well, we don't have that anymore. We don't have official culture anymore. We have the Internet. We have YouTube. We have all these uh, alternative techniques for generation of culture and communication at our disposal. And so I see the, the spectacle as telescopic. It can telescope actuality. You can create illusion, which is vital, and not vital in like the master slave sense. But I mean, you you basically can necromance <laughs> and and perform your own wizardry against uh, these systems that that otherwise are claimed to kind of dominate your life. And and look at look at what you can do. I mean, you can simulate terroristic scenarios and get the whole mechanism to react. We got the entire might of the United United States State Department. The Political Military Bureau of Affairs, the Director of Defense Trade Control, the Office of Technological Security in the Army. I mean, we got them all to respond to what was or what could have otherwise just been a garage project completed on a weekend. I mean, it's about toying with overcoming, goosing the power systems themselves and, and displaying how easy it is to do. And um, 
kind of giving them the scenarios that they otherwise hyperventilate about to justify um, the, the control. So it's, it's just a kind of culture terrorism, if, if you will. What is the way that an individual person who is a freedom-loving person who, who understands the threat from to possible tyrannical governments or actual current tyrannical governments, what is the best way for um, just an individual citizen to to respond to these things? Or how should they be thinking about a project like yours? Like, should they be, oh, okay. yeah, should they be sharing it with other people? Should they be, like, how how are we supposed to speak to those people in power and to, to show them that, you know, we're, we're not going to be, uh, okay. have, you know, be put under the boot? I'll try to give more like pragmatic advice. So it's uh, like like 19th century German anarchism is a good place here. So expanding free spheres of action, traditional anarchist uh, relations with power and labor are, are are useful. So I mean, using technology to avoid or as best you can avoid uh, traditional analysis or or mediation by these technical powers and corporations is a good thing. But um, what I like to add on top of that is a friendly contempt for these regimes. I mean, really give it to them. Uh, negation isn't enough. I, I guess that's my only real addition. Like, when uh, when California tries to, to go after the entire domestic production of firearms in its state, everyone everyone responds as you would traditionally expect with a Tea Party style response. Oh, well, tell Governor Brown no. Well, no, they know you don't want it. They hate you. They actively, like, to, their, to your bone, they actively hate you and see you as, like, pathological and something that could be, like, medically eliminated. I mean, they're, they're not interested in a conversation, a traditional political conversation where you say, you know, we'd rather keep our right to violence. No, you have to fight them on, a, on like, a higher level, like a higher order of magnitude. Um, we do it with defense distributed by, I mean, giving them their ghost gun scenario, laughing at them, taking away their, their feelings of security, like pulling out the rug. So negation isn't enough. My suggestion is you have to use technical means, means of culture and spectacle, um, to actively thwart them, because illusion is is the place where we're doing this right now. Um, does anyone have a ghost gun right now? No, they don't. Use images, use culture, and take away the feelings of surety and and progress and destiny that the liberal horde clads itself in. Because they don't have those things. That's all ideology, and you play into it too when you when you act like they have the power to take things away from you. They don't. Yeah, I think I, I've said this a few times on the podcast. Like, but like the technological horses out of the barn. Like, you could you could have subdued the masses, you know, back in the Bronze Age, um, but but now it's unless you're gonna be unless you're gonna be like in a dystopian nightmare society, you know, in a in a science fiction novel. Like, we're either gonna go that way or it's gonna go the way of freedom. There's not if you this fine line of like. Of NSA spying, of um, uh, of massive government oversight, of huge um, government largesse that that kind of controls every aspect of your life, that can't sustain itself for very long. Now that we have the technology to fight, things. like we have Twitter, we have we have thing, we have technology that can spread information, um, ideas, tech, you know, just manufacturing advances, like in the blink of an eye. So there's really not going to be any way for us to to stop this, and I think you're right. Like on a on a practical level, voting for the person that the NRA tells you to vote for is, is not enough. I mean, you really need to. Um, it needs to be something that that comes from a higher force than just the the, the right to vote. Right, right. I, I'll add in a couple things if you don't mind. Um, so for, you mentioned the NRA. I mean, the NRA is is powerful political institution, and we can't discount that in, in traditional terms. Like, obviously, uh, their influence, their lobbyists, ILA, were instrumental in stopping um, Manchin Toomey. We all know that that's true. And, you know, credit where credit's due, but at the same time, this is a this is a, a political machinery which sees itself first as a fundraiser and a permanent lobby. It, it, re- it rests on the institutional mediation of firearms technology, and traditional firearms manufacturer as an element of how we get access to guns. And so it will never become a kind of, um, I don't even want to compare them to another organization. It will never be uh, a raw Second Amendment, you know, fundamentalist interpretive organization, even if members of its current board of directors, you know, have those great feelings. It's first and foremost a political lobby that wants to preserve itself as a permanent political lobby. 
Um, so we have to you have to think outside of terms of institutional mediation. And I know I do things with defense distribution, which is itself an organization. But maybe this is how Amir put it to me the other day. You know, middle class, feel good, <laughs> social activists, even in the libertarian circles, they don't have the, even the same conceptual vocabulary. Like it's not enough to put your name on a, on a list, do some volunteering, and, and kind of have good feelings about the future of the world. I mean, we're up against death cults in the Islamic State, people who've been brainwashed from a very early age, like in the, the army within the armies in Iran, for example. I mean, you're, you're up against a completely different conversation. Uh, and middle class feel-goodism isn't what's going to bring us uh, to, to significant points of conflict or, or cultural overcoming. And, you know, I know I've, that's a big diversion here. I mean, I, I meant to get back to some other some other traditional political critiques, Um if, if you want, we can keep going. I, I don't want to kind of yeah, talk yeah. about that. Let me hit, let me hit that stuff again. So, to call it utopianism is to, is to use a slur, and I don't mean, I don't mean to slur it, but some, some technophobe critics are right. Like, it's not enough also to say, like, well, we're in the era of Facebook and, and technical disintermediation of traditional social engineering and social administration. While this is true, we should also recognize that these tools, like Facebook, Twitter, are being used mostly as like a, a spider's web and a dragnet to collect more information and sell more information about us. They're not pure tools of liberation. Or, to use a, a different theoretical framework, even the tools of liberation lead to other ab reactions and subjugations. So, uh, in the end, freedom and liberty are simple solutions that aren't complete. Like, they're, they're easy answers and that they don't actually lend to kind of bigger insights like like what we're trying to get, which is imminent reversal. Like Facebook isn't a solution. Facebook is a data harvester, which is going to learn everything about you. Uh, voting voting research, uh, medical research, and these things get leaked to the press all the time. They we're, in a, we're in the era of quantifiable self, of technologies of the self, like in Foucault's terms, where instead of a traditional power, uh, a stupid totalitarian power in 20th century terms kind of administering over you in a, in a visible way, now you volunteer all the information about yourself, which is which is harvested in you know massive cloud combines, sold to interested corporate uh, and, and governmental parties, and you did it all yourself voluntarily. And so one of the, the staggering or troubling insights is that you want some level of subjugation. You depend upon it. Um, so like there's not I, I don't want to be one of the agents of promoting easy technological solutionism, what I'm trying to say is you have more tools, like the, lib- the radical libertarian has more tools in his kit uh, than he's normally prepared to admit, because a lot of the liberty conversation is mired in 20th or early 21st century productivist debates about, basically that uses the same vocabulary from Marx. I mean, Mises and Marx, uh, we're all talking about use value. I know, I know I'm going a bit overboard here, but so maybe I can, I can distill it a bit more of it. Basically, I don't, as defense distributed, uh, we don't want to just promote glib technological solutionism because that's what's coming out of the valley, that's what's coming out of venture, and it's just another way to bind you to capital and traditional techniques of subjugation just by another means. You just don't realize it because now you're volunteering your information. You're still being social engineered. Uh, and even in the end, you realize freedom isn't, isn't even the answer to the question. It's a kind of facile solution um, that doesn't raise, it doesn't get you to the level of uh, of playing the game that we want to, we want to let you play. Like there's never going to be. I don't think there's ever going to be the final liberty solution. We just think right now, um, like defense distributed promotes that digital libertarians, radical libertarians, play with a more expanded toolkit. Um, because like things like Bitcoin. Crazy. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, but more than just technology. I mean, conceptual tools too. Like uh, Mises and all these other groups. Uh, the, the way we traditionally analyze problems of liberty is just in use value, exchange value, um, price discovery, all these traditional political economy answers to problems, which actually contain no no cultural analysis, no metaphysics, uh, which is seen as kind of trite and out of out of fashion for the cold rationalist libertarian. But in fact, have become extremely useful because we're in intensely ideological times, um, and so we. My contribution is that you actually have to get a bit cultish. You have to actually get uh, on the level of some of these of these death cults and, and play games with death and put things into play and use the techniques of seduction and challenge. Um, these are all elemental, like um, I don't know, ele- elements of John Baudrillard's theory and philosophy. So I guess um, 
we want you to become playful. We don't want you just to become a, a technological solution oriented rationalist libertarian. Um, the last couple of centuries of planning and political actors have created like a grand playground for you. So I don't mean to sound all doom and gloom, but you know that you can play with a whole lot more than you think. And and this is why being a hacker, even though hackers aren't the apex predators anymore, uh, this is some of the insight of like black hat. There's grand systems here for you to manipulate and use, culture systems, spectacle systems, political systems too. And while they're all in dissolution, there's all these interesting recombinations and uh, and techniques, like aggressive techniques you can use to basically thwart traditional authority. I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. I appreciate you um, kind of giving us a little bit of insight into your political theory and and how you see kind of things from a more of a macro macro level than just, you know, putting this out into the world. Um, like our, our podcast is is brought we bring a specifically like Christian worldview to our to our podcast. So um okay. so so we have we have the idea that um freedoms are given by God, that they're not um human created, so therefore we don't have the we don't have the right, the moral right to impose our um our uh, tyrannies on other people, and so people are, are basically made free, and we should be following the law of God. So, uh, so in, in that, those respects, like I completely um, agree with what you're saying because it's like we we don't have, um, like I believe personally, we don't have the right to like just you know make up these these um, you know crazy uh, restrictions on people, and that people should really be free. So, uh, but yeah, it sounds like you're you're coming from. Are you coming from like an anarcho-capitalist type of model? People label me with that all the time. I mean, maybe that's my lifestyle. I guess I, you know, if, if you walk like a duck, talk like a duck. So I guess I am an anarcho-capitalist if I have a multi-million-dollar company and believe in anarchy. But I don't know, man. I I'd like to call myself something just other, different to get people's minds kind of jostled again, like uh, a transversal, for example. <laughs> you know, like, I believe in seduction. <laughs> I believe in imminent reversal. Like, um, I think it's so interesting that this has been a christian theme podcast because I, I think strong ideas, strong historical ideas, God being the most obvious among them, uh, are so much more preferable to the soft and, and weak historical hypotheses that kind of rule the day now about, like, oh, human progress, linear you know, freedom. <laughs> no one, no one even has a tolerance for these ideas anymore. They're like the, uh, I don't know, the the entire like uh, political spectrum is like asphyxiated on the ideas of just like compulsory liberty and political equality. Like, I I believe in in radical equality, but I, uh, but these traditional like democratically and progressively fueled ideas. I mean, we're all bored of them now, and and stronger historical ideas like like destiny and God are just so threatening and, and they've been so long out of fashion that now they're coming back with a vengeance and are becoming again the axis on which all all struggle is now being fought. I mean look at the Islamic State. Like we're back. God is back. <laughs> Even if he shouldn't be. Well right, well I mean there's uh there's the the God of, of ISIS that um kills people that don't agree with him. But then there's the God of the Bible who talks about um you're not supposed to like one of the biblical principles is you should not make two laws, one for one set of people and one for another for a different set of people. Like you shouldn't be setting one set of rules for the political elite and another set of rules for the poor. Like everyone should be treated the same under the law. And as we know, that that never ever happens, even in things like parking tickets. So the idea, like our idea, is that um, that there's either there's either two choices. There's either um, God's law or man's law, and man's law will always try to to elevate itself to the place of God, where where God actually should be, and that means that people will try to install themselves as a tyrant, as a ruler, as as a dictator, as, as a god, and that's like the that's like the natural bent of human beings to to try to put themselves in the place of where God is, and that's kind of that's why we brought a biblical perspective to this specific issue because we believe that. Um, Firearms historically and, and weapons in general have been have been integral to to maintaining freedom. We talk a lot about on the podcast a particular story that happened in the, the Old Testament book of Samuel. Um, the first king in Israel had 
had a king, King Saul, where he oh, abdicated his his abdicated his responsibility, and, and in Israel there was not even blacks. The, the field of blacksmithing had become illegal, so that people couldn't make any weapons, and they couldn't even sharpen their their farming implements. They had to go down to the government post and pay pay a, a tax to get their farming implements. And then that's how, why you had like the David and Goliath situation, and why they were they were subjugated from the Philistines. And so, like even from a biblical perspective, the idea that um, having the citizenry disarmed is never a good thing, and uh, it only leads to more and more tyranny. So we're glad that you think, are. Yeah. We're glad that you, you know, you're I'm, putting that out there. I'm a I'm a bit of a I mean I'm really an amateur when it comes to biblical studies, but you know, my my lesson from the whole Saul episode. Is that uh, you know, the people demanded to be sub- to, to be subjected? The people demanded to be the subjects of, of a king, and and so God, as a as a good anarchist, was saying, "Look, you don't need a king." <laughs> and they, the people of Israel said, "No, no, we need a king. We need a king." So, um, and of course, you know, God God was aware, at least in the story, that a uh, a king would be a good a good object lesson for uh, for all the people of Israel, and that they would suffer greatly under being ruled and. And maybe that's an insight from a, a group like Defense Distributed. Um, we we like humiliating people who would set themselves up as arbiters of power uh, and authority, even though the people clamor and want this authority. Um, yeah, you know. yeah, they want to they want to feel safe. It's it's funny to me, like things like um, and this is kind of getting off the, the subject, but like the, the traditional conservative people who are against the government, they don't want they don't want government taking their guns and their health care and things like that. But then they want the federal government. To, to be the one to, to keep out all illegal aliens and they want the government to, to spend billions and billions of dollars on unnecessary foreign wars. And you have, you have a situation where in one sense they, they give lip service to the idea that they want to be free. They want the government to mind their own business and, and not, and not bother them, but they vote for the people that are installing, um, massive, massive government oversight. Um, and you know, NSA, FBI, CIA, all that type of thing. And I think um, criticism is is well is well founded, but I mean at the same time, if if there's going to be a, you know quote unquote legitimate uses for the state or for government, surely public safety uh, and border sure. you know re- retainment is, is, is going to be an aspect of that. My you know like when when I remember when I recall the story with with the, with Israel and Saul. There seems to be more of a demand for a king just for the trappings of being a, a respected nation more than public safety. It was like, well, we want a king because we want to feel like a big, important power. And I'm seeing way more of that imagistic uh, need to just feel like a power, feel like we have solutions coming out of our government more over and above any kind of technical uh, safety concerns, law and order concerns. And uh, so by by analogy... Uh, we want to pop everybody's bubbles of feeling like they're powerful when, when in fact, all they're doing is instituting the engines uh, of this, this expropriation uh, and, and misery. Yeah, we, well, we believe that that the civil government is ordained by God, so that like there is there is a legitimate function for civil authority, which is to enforce contracts, to punish people who do um, commit crimes against other people. And, uh, and those are the, like the main functions of, of the civil government under biblical law, but, um, so many Christians, uh, they want to rebel against that as well, as well as just your liberal, socialist, fascist person. Yeah. I, I, you know, the nat- natural law, right? And, uh, a lot of the early enlightenment thought influenced or informed by, you know, a, a deist centered political Philosophy is still, even if it's been sublated, is still probably the best means of, of preserving people's lives and property than <laughs> any other any other man-made system. And uh, you know, the Jews were good communists for a while. Uh, Fifty-year jubilees and all these other ideas, which are just like totally forbidden now because they're not, not they're not right thinking. But um, you could do worse than having a, a monotheistic, you know, political philosophy. So. Uh, but I, I yeah, think well, they're the, a fellow travelers. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you can do worse with a monotheistic um, political philosophy if if he tells you to, you know, behead the infidel. So, so we do want to be we, <laughs> we definitely we definitely want to be careful uh, on which God we are uh, are promoting. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, well, look, respect um, where respect is due, man. They're willing to blow themselves up for their God. I mean, that's power. 
And even if it's immoral, we're not talking about morals. We're, you know, we're talking about stakes. They don't want to blow themselves up for theirs. Well, here's, the, here's the difference. Yeah, well, here's the difference I see between um, Christian martyrs of the past and and, and Muslim martyrs today. Um, you have people who who did not have the promise. You have people who did not have the promise of anything extra special because they they gave up their lives. I mean, they they were assured of their salvation ahead of time, and they they did they were willing to suffer. Um, you know, having somebody promise you you're going to get something extra special to blow yourself up. You know, in a moment, like it's, we don't we don't see we don't see um, Muslims suffering torture, uh, you know, for years on end um, for their faith. We see them blowing them up, themselves up in, in one kind of swift, swift. Oh, action. I see. Your criticism is that well, they're taking the easy way out. It's not hard to make a split second decision, blow yourself up. That's true, but at the same time, it's an accusation that they're cowards, which is an admission that uh, that they're not playing by your rules. Um, Western dictated rules are, if you'll allow the criticism, this is this is in Baudrillard's Requiem for the Turn sure. Towers. Um, the rules are dictated by a system that says, well, fight fair. Uh, you know, we're, we want to fight you by traditional terms. They end up taking their own deaths and using them as an ultimate weapon, injecting into a system which demands zero deaths, you know, surgical warfare. No one should have to die. It's actually a, a beautiful and sublime weapon. This this form of like terrorism because there's no answer for it in traditional Western discourse. They want to die as much as we want to kill them, and uh, it totally changes the rules of the game. So I would I would just offer that yes, maybe there's you know a valid religious critique from your perspective, but their terrorist hypothesis is a novel and incredible innovation which has set everything on its head since uh, really since the whole 9/11 era. Well, the, the the modern application, I think, of it is, is really um, it's it's uh, it's very dangerous because they have you know a, a fighter going into war and just kind of have like a suicide mission is one thing, but to have like um, you know bombs of huge magnitude to to kill thousands and thousands of people at one time that really ups the ante. And and we've and what Christians believe, or what a lot of Christians believe, and what I believe is that the, the logical conclusion of Islam is what we see today. It's not, it's not, when we talk about radical Islam, it's not really all that radical. It's just really following the logical ends of the worldview. And the idea of, of killing oh, yeah. is, I in mean, the Quran, it, is in the Quran. <laughs> it's, it's, it's there. It's not like, it's not there. You, conversely, you don't see the, in the New Testament, that, you know, Jesus telling people to take up arms and start swinging, you know. So um, well, this, there, there's um, a huge difference. Sure, sure. Our our Islam and and, and Christianity fundamentally fundamentally different systems. Yes, you, you know I, I have um, Defense Tribute actually has a couple of, of Muslims that that work for it, and and these are the oh you know the traditional middle class American Muslims who are who are inoffensive and in, in the sense that we demand they be inoffensive. But you know I, I would add that what you what you're seeing in, with IS and these other these other groups. I mean that's like you're saying, that's what Muhammad's army would have looked like. And how can you get mad at people for uh, really practicing their religion in a fundamental sense? I mean, that's actually what to believe. You know, this uh, Islam, as I as I read it, is a political ideology. It's not just a, a pure abstract religion that you can kind of take with you to the coffee shop. It, it depends upon uh, an empire and a caliph. And uh, look, they're enacting it because they really believe it. I mean, they really believe it. You know, a whole brigade of death, they're, they're having such stunning victories because they're willing to go anywhere uh, in Serac and, uh, and and take huge losses to, to achieve a victory. I mean, there's no respect for, there's no overvaluing of the individual. They, they have the ideology first, and it's working. And um, so, you know, the dispute between Christianity and Islam side, obviously they're different and, and categorically different faith systems, but Islam also has a, a, a political ideology, and we're seeing it finally, I would say, we're seeing a real, I think, authentic version of it. Now, does that sound like respect? Maybe there's a little respect there, yeah. But, um, yeah, the, the world is, is becoming much more harsher and radicalized, and these elements have to be fought with in a way that the, the current political climate and, and regimes over here in the U.S. aren't even capable of having the conversation. Yeah, um, it's that's very interesting that you that you picked up on that. I mean, just from a from a a spiritual perspective, um, I, I, it's, it's interesting because we, we as Christians talk all the time about 
about the about this idea about following things to their logical conclusion. And uh, one of the, the critiques internally of Christianity is that it does not follow it does not follow its own logic, and people do not follow their what they say their beliefs are to their logical conclusion. They want it to be a coffee shop theology. They want it to be um, just kind of my my ability to to personalize it for myself, but it really doesn't have any bearing on on how I, I really live my life or or who I vote for or what I buy or what work I take up um, or how I spend my free time. It's just kind of um, for me myself, and it's it it, it doesn't it doesn't mean anything else. But uh, yeah, so that, I'm I'm well, you know, this I is, find it very this is why Nietzsche said this is why Nietzsche said God was dead. Um, most Christians should be familiar with this with yep. this evaluation. Uh, you know, every every church was a sepulchre to his, to the idea because you know uh, most most American Christians, even if faithful and, and regular, uh, they've got time for God on Sunday morning, as and that's a cool regulative social idea. But they make almost they almost demand that it be inoffensive and not conflict with their kind of materialist uh, lifestyles and really their hedonistic lifestyles as well. I mean, and I'm believe me, I am not willing and and really been interested in criticizing Christians. I, I trust Christians more, more than almost any other class of person out here in the, in the States, um, especially Mormons. But but maybe that's another dispute. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, there's a, there's a real, obviously, there's a real conflict between um, the demands of feel-good Protestantism and what I see as the doctrine of Christ crucified and the, the strict demands that that should place on your life. You know, this uh, that it's almost like a life-wrecking event, like uh, a Damascus Road-style event should be what dictates and centers the life of, of a saved person. Uh, in my, again, admittedly amateurish study of Christianity, so um, obviously there's uh, people that don't believe it uh, as hard as these fundamentalists in, uh, in the Middle East do. Cody, you have ex- you have explained Christianity better than like 99% of the Christians that. I have ever come across <laughs> and that ever talk about it because you're right. There's there's the idea that uh, C.S. Lewis who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia series. Um, he has the idea that like Jesus was either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he was really Lord. And so that concept should change your life if he really is Lord. If he really is who he says he was, then it is incumbent upon every person to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. If he's not, then everything he said and everything that we're doing. Like uh, the Apostle Paul said in one of his letters, he said, if, if Christ is not raised, if he did not really rise from the dead, then we, of all people on the earth, are the people to be most pitied because we're so stupid, pretty much is, is the implication. So we, as Christians, we have a lot riding on this idea that Jesus is who he says he was. And, um, and that really should impact how we live our lives. It's not just a cultural convenience. It's not just, um, and, it, and it was for so long for so many people. They they belong to a church because that's where business was done. But really, it it should impact massively how you live your life, what you um, what you think about the world, and how you interact with it. So, um, you know, th- that this is profound. I'm I'm so I'm so glad I talked to you. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, you know, I in the political philosophy of like Carl Schmitt, for example, and. This is a 20th century and a rather controversial political philosopher, but you know he, he was saying the world has passed through these different centered epochs, and you know, admittedly, um, God as an idea isn't the central spoke of, of our present epoch. We're now in in really a you could say economical, but I think we've passed from economical to a totally technical paradigm now, technological paradigm. Tech, like uh, the central social questions are our relationship to technology and how that's supposed to intermediate our lives. Um, but right, you know, uh, big, big ideas like God, um, you know, if, if, if we're going to see a resurgence of, I don't know, this kind of Christian based liberty that you're talking about, you know, you want to see people preaching Christ crucified and, um, yeah, man, anytime, anytime you want to bring me in on this conversation, well, let me know.